Is redemption limited to the resurrection of human beings? Will creation be left out of the redemption? Or will creation be part of the redemption? Stay tuned to a fascinating introduction to this subject. Hi there, I'm Lee Brainerd. Welcome to Soothkeep and another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible. My mission is truth, truth at any cost, truth above every other consideration. Now, the subject that we're looking at today, of course, is the redemption. Now, we know that the redemption uh, is going to be manifested to the church in the resurrection. For instance, in Romans 8.23, we read, we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So the believer's body is going to be redeemed from the ravages of sin, from the ravages of the curse, from death. And for the church, of course, this resurrection is going to happen at the rapture for the Old Testament saints and for the tribulation saints, this resurrection redemption is going to happen at the second coming. But there is an aspect of redemption that some people overlook when they investigate prophetic subjects. And that is the redemption of creation. Now, I want you to notice that in the very same passage that we were just reading in Romans chapter 8, in verses 19 through 22, we read about the redemption of creation. Verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the entirety of creation groans in labors with birth pangs together, even until now. So creation is going to be released, redeemed from the same curse that man is going to be released from. And creation gets to share in the glorious liberty of the children of God. And this, portation, this participation occurs at the revealing, that is, the manifestation of the sons of God, which happens at the second coming. There's more testimony in the scripture that goes in this direction. For instance, we read about the times of refreshing in Acts 3.19, and we read about the times of the restitution of all things in Acts 3.21. In all of these passages, nature is changed at the same time that man is changed so that it brings great blessing to redeemed mankind. Now, many think that redeemed creation is so polluted that it must be destroyed and replaced. And they'll point to passages like 1 Peter chapter 3, where we see the destruction of the heavens and the earth by fire. And, but what they're missing is that the destruction in this passage is parallel with the destruction of the flood. The, and it doesn't demand or teach or imply annihilation. If you think about it, now, the, the flood completely destroyed the earth but it didn't annihilate it. It was still here. It was just greatly changed by judgment. And at the second coming, the earth is going to be greatly changed by the judgments of fire and the great shaking. Now, folks will also point to Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, where the new heavens and the new earth are mentioned after the thousand years. But this location doesn't prove annihilation. It doesn't prove the replacement of the current heavens and earth. Um, the replacement in the sense of one ceases to exist, and one set ceases to exist, and then another set comes into existence. The location here only reminds the readers of the fact and the necessity of a new heavens and a new earth. 
Now, and the location here also makes sense because the New Jerusalem cannot come down from heaven until two conditions are met. The first is that the earth has to be renewed, and the second is that the thousand years have to be finished. Now, in the context, we just finished discussing the thousand years, and so the new heavens and the new earth is brought in just as a reminder that that condition is already fulfilled too. Therefore, we can go straight to the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, which is going to bring the Father down to earth here, so that we're going to have the physical presence of the Holy Spirit indwelling all the believers. We'll have the physical presence of the Son and the physical presence of the Father, the entirety of the Trinity, to go on into eternity. Now, the fact is, the annihilation of the heavens and the earth are contrary to revelation and fact. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole complement of arguments in this video. In the future videos, I'll probably cover an argument here and an argument there. I want to keep this video short, to the point, and on an introductory level. But I am going to raise some very thought-provoking questions to stir your interest in the subject. So, here's my first question. Why would the Lord redeem creation and then throw it away. We saw in Romans chapter 8 that nature is redeemed from the curse at the second coming, brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Why throw it away later? Further, if redeemed humans cannot lose their salvation, why can redeemed nature lose its deliverance? How can Redeemed nature lose its redemption. My second observation and question is this. The guilty rebels, angels and humans, are not annihilated. They're eternally sequestered. So why would the Lord annihilate innocent creation, which was the victim and not the perpetrator? I mean, when you stop and think about it, the whole thing makes zero sense. Sequester the guilty and destroy the innocent? Kind of sounds like liberalism, doesn't it? My third point is this. If, if man is redeemed and creation is not redeemed, then ultimately... God ends up redeeming far less than he lost to the devil in the garden. If you recall the scenario, before the fall, God walked with Adam in the garden in the cool of the evening. They had fellowship. And if there had been no fall, this fellowship with mankind would have continued for all of eternity. It was God's design and God's desire to have fellowship with mankind. Now, after the fall, the curse was brought down upon earth, it was brought down upon man, brought down upon all creation. And from that point on, man labored under the curse, creation labored under the curse, innocent creation labored under the curse. Now, man is blood redeemed. And the heavens and the earth are going to be redeemed by eviction of the ungodly perpetrators and by cleansing with fire. Here's another point. If the heavens and the earth are annihilated, then the new heavens and the new earth are not a redemption, but a replacement. Now, this is an interesting scenario because we as human beings, we're not replaced. We are redeemed. We are saved. We're changed. We're glorified. I think that we need to have an analogy here. If the guilty party can be saved and redeemed and glorified, then it makes sense that the heavens and the earth, which were innocent parties, they were the victims, that they also can be delivered redeemed and glorified. 
Now, this is just a sampling of the reasons why I am convinced that the new heavens and the new earth are a renovation and not a replacement why I believe that the new heavens and the earth are going to be refurbished by fire in a way analogous to the earth being refurbished by the flood. And why I believe that the Lord is going to uh, salvage, save, and redeem the earth just like he salvaged, saved, and redeemed mankind. Now, if you want uh, a large group of arguments, uh, numerous arguments that are fully developed from the Bible for the permanency of the heavens and the earth and for the renovation of the heavens and the earth, then check out my book, The New Heavens and the New Earth, which is available on Amazon in paperback and in Kindle version. It's also available on Barnes & Noble on uh, Apple iBooks, on Kobo, on Google, and on Smashwords. And I, if you're a student, I encourage you to look into this subject and do some serious reading and investigation. There's a lot of material in this book that'll be helpful on the study. For hungry believers, few things are as rewarding as gaining light on a difficult subject. Eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire. We'll see you next time.